It's yours. It's one of these. Okay. Um, I'm going to present you the real-time labor evaluations. I call them floor checks, like we said previously. Has anyone had a floor check performed at their location? How long ago was it? Well, it was very often. Uh -huh. Yeah, usually, uh, well, before not it. <laughs> but usually, more often. <laughs> It'll lock. Um, some of the topics um, that get promoted to floor checks is we're going to discuss what is a real time labor evaluation, uh, why do you say performs these floor checks, uh, what you need to uh, provide us um, ahead of time before we get going, and will you receive a mass notification. Mm -hmm. When we do the actual floor check, we show up to the location unannounced. So you don't know when we're coming. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> That's how you really feel. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's, it's funny to see him and then you look at the look on your face. And, <laughs> and you're trying to sneak out these emails that we tell you not to sneak out. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is a real-time labor evaluation? It actually includes evaluating the timekeeping procedures and internal controls. Um, we like to review your policies and procedures. Um, are you training the employees? Do they know what's going on? And we'll find a lot of that, that out once we do the interview of the employees. <laughs> yeah, that knowledgeable yeah, of what's going on. And most like Jody says, the internal controls, make sure you have adequate procedures in place to record the hours and the time that is promptly in charge. Um, we'll discuss it further also on the employee interviews. We'll be discussing the nature of the work performed with them, like what are they doing right now, uh, what contract are they working on, or are they doing indirect cost. And we'll kind of also observe their employee's workstation. You know, if we get there and the employee has his legs all kicked up, you know, playing something on his, you know, could build break, you know, but, you know, just observe what they're doing and they'll describe, you know, what's going to serve in the web. <laughs> Um, we'll also do analysis of employee timekeeping practices. Um, you know, are they doing electronic time sheets? Back in the old days, we always had paper, you know, copies. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. But yeah, you're showing your age, darling. I know. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I know. <laughs> and also, we'll reconcile the labor charges that we pull, the time sheets we pull. We'll reconcile those labor costs back to the payroll ledgers and job costs. All right, why does the state perform these four checks? Um, we're going to basically want to test your compliance with the timekeeping controls. Do you have any deficiencies that, that we can address on a real time basis? Um, so if I go on there and pull the timesheets, see if they're charging you know, on a timely basis, their hours, and if it's input properly in the county records, um, we also use that. Um, just to announce the labor charging and the cost allocation practices. You know, if you have an employee, he has several contracts that he's working on. How does he mon monitor his hours? And how are you charging that? Are you charging it to the contract properly? Um, you can have some contractors who work fixed price. They're running out of funding, and you know, sometimes the employees can maybe try to sneak in work in the cost type, charging the cost type to offset that. But um, we also to support. Yeah, the floor check to support the incur cost audits performed at a later date. So basically, if we did a floor check this year, we would use those results from when we did at the 2016 incur cost audit. It may be 24 months later. We're getting there. But um, we'll use that analysis, and it can help us sometimes offset doing additional testing of your labor costs. If we find out that the adequacy of the labor's charges to the correct accounts are correct, like indirect accounts or other cost objectives, um, it's properly being charged, and um, you know, and the employees know exactly what's going on and how to charge your time. All right, what will you need to provide us? All right, it's way in advance of our floor check, we try to do it, you know, further in advance so you're not aware of when we're about to come out. We will request a copy of the, the current listing of your employees and their locations. So if you have employees who are located at your, you know, your location, but there's some that look at right at Air Force Base. We will need to know which area they're at, area A or B, or which building they're also in. We'll need a copy of your timekeeping procedures. Um, 
and also if there's a home to work program, if there's employees who telework, we'll need a copy of those agreements, or not agreements, but the procedures, policy procedures, so you are aware of, you know, if they are teleworking, uh, what kind of monitoring procedures are going on, and, and do, are they aware of, you know, keeping track of their time as well as when they're working at home. And also a point of contact for the employee interviews. So when we do show up, we know exactly who to, to ask for when we arrive. You want someone who is knowledgeable, who knows all the employees. We don't want someone who's like, okay, where's, where's Bob? And they're like, I don't know Bob. So it kind of delays the process. So you'd like to have someone who is knowledgeable. Um, who's there? Where they're located at? And it can help you there. And also, if there's like employees on base, sometimes you're like in a classified area. So the person who's helping you at the headquarters or your office may not have access to on base. So. It's also good to have a separate point of contact. But and also the point of contact we use, they may have access to all the payroll, like their payrolls or timesheets. So sometimes that's good to have that point of contact. So when you arrive, you tell them, I want all these employees' names, I want their timesheets. They can pop up themselves on a real-time basis. If not, we'll just go to the employees' workstation and get it from them. All right, will you receive an advanced notification? No. no. <laughs> All right, we now we perform these unannounced, so we're not calling you in advance when we show you when we show up. Um, so you will know, we'll try not to do it, you know, Monday morning, you know, always something more. But uh, we try to do it, you know, nice, nice time. Uh, we will arrive at your location, we'll request to meet your point of contact, and the auditor will request to interview the employees at their assigned location. Uh, we do also ask you: do not tell them we're coming. Sometimes we'll flip out and send email to all employees. Beware, DCA's here. I remember a time, I'm gonna say, well, I'm getting old, but my son's 14, almost 14, but I was pregnant. And it's usually two of us auditors will go out together, because one will write down during the interview what the, what the employee's saying, while the other auditor's just asking the questions. We told them we're going on base, don't tell the employees we're coming. So me and another girl, we were both pregnant, got the pop, and we get on base, and I start naming this, this, this gentleman. I can see on his computer screen, it, it's bold. It said, beware, DCA's coming. Oh, he answered all the questions just like this. Oh, no. <laughs> I was looking right behind him, and he, he had this look on his face like, I'm, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, you know, so after the interview, you know, the point, I'm like, where are we going next? I'm like, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> you know, he's like crap because I knew who exactly sent the email too because it said that you know the VP's name was sitting right there and everything. Like I told you that's not we're and so it was pointless. I said, but it was you know it was funny at the time. Afterwards, but I felt bad for the employee who had it laying up his computer screen. All right. Also, um, if we select someone and they are teleworking at the time. Um, we will actually go and talk to the employee supervisor and we'll interview to verify that there's control over the employees work at home procedures um, and their schedules so they know exactly what is the employee doing, what they work on, what contract they're on. Um, we also will request to speak to that individual over the phone. So we'll discuss with them you know, the work at home procedures, discuss specific work being performed, I'll be tell you, and, and we'll also request a charge number, what, what charge number they're using when they're at work, when they're at teleworking. And also, if we have some follow-up questions, we can also request an employee, interview the employee during a follow-up visit. So if the employee goes to the office, we may just do a face-to-face, -face, just to, you know, just get to know them and make sure that they are who they are. The purpose of the employee interviews is pretty much to kind of verify that they actually exist. You know, you don't want contract are charging for labor category in these hours, you know, make up a name to, yeah, we have this person working this category, like, where are they, you know, so you want very, actually verify the name that they have exists, and you have some that go on vacation when you're there, or they just got laid off or list left the organization, so you need your procedures to verify there are paperwork in place that we can confirm that. Um, we also make sure the labor charges are to the appropriate cost objective. You know, if you're saying you work on this contract A, 
then make sure that that's what the charge is for on timesheet red reflects. Um, so, and, and sometimes the employees can be pretty honest, you know, what they're doing and what they're charging or, you know, admit that they're charging a different contract, you know. But, and also, if they're working on two contracts, how are they, how are they monitoring their hours? You know, are you working 50-50 or how do you keep track of every daily, daily hours? Uh, also, I'll verify that they're working on their performing and assigned job classifications. Mm -hmm. If you say you're a program manager, but they're charging your hours as a civil engineer, it's like, okay, you know, what's the difference? Why are they doing that? So just procedures like that. And just make sure to determine their hours, their report hours charged, or a fair represent of the work being performed. So, so they say they work on two contracts, but you grab their timesheet and they're charging six hours to one and two to the other, but you knew they told you they work equally on one, on both of them. That's where some red flags in it. All right, some of the interview questions that we'll ask them. We'll ask them their current job title. We'll ask them a description of their current projects. Sometimes when you're talking to an engineer too, they can go really elaborate, you know, what they're doing. One time this guy had a whiteboard, he just started drawing all the <laughs> I was like, I'm an otter, I don't know that means something a little bit. That makes you feel good, tell me what you're doing. I'm like, okay, whatever helps, you know. Because sometimes they're so nervous when you first approach their desk space and they don't know what to expect, so you just let them keep talking. Um, we'll also ask them the how long they work on the contract, when did it start, um, when's the estimate time for it to end. Um, what charge numbers are you using on, the, on, the, um, on their project? So what they tell you they're working, you'll take their time sheet and make sure that's what they're being charged. And ask them the percentage of time on each project, that's important to us. And also we ask them to explain their procedures for revising their time sheets. Um, that's good because they should have these, should know this by their policy procedures. But you want to make sure if they have an error on their time sheet, that there's added controls that allows the employee to make the changes. Um, that not just, you know, there could be circumstances where a supervisor needs to make the changes, but there needs to be oversight to where the employee can go in and, and, and check off as well. You don't want like an employee just turning in a blank time sheet and allowing the supervisor to just charge the hours to, to what contract they fill. All right, um, the auditor will be asked the employee for a copy of their timesheet when you arrive at their workstation or we'll request them to open up their timesheets, timekeeping application. So we'll watch their, um, we'll get to say, hey, can you show us your timesheet electronically and, and print off a copy? So you can watch them do it and, and print it off. So you may get a copy of it from, you know, the point of contact at the very beginning, but it's also nice to have them pulled up to make sure it matches what the employee has and what the supervisor has. Um, other items you may include is copies of their timekeeping procedures, um, a written copy description of their projects, their identification number, and that they have authorization for charging their current projects. A lot of times they should get at the beginning of the, of the contract when they start working a job description of what their scope of work that they're doing and what the charge number is so the employee knows exactly what they're working on and what they're required to do. And you also may, the auditor may also question the management and the accounting system department or the personnel to further clarify and confirm the employee's statements. If you're a little leery on what they say or something just doesn't add up, it's okay for us to talk to them as well. You know, we may just call them after our visit as well and, and ask the questions. Um, when we do talk to the employees, the main understanding we want to get from them is, are they aware of what the timekeeping procedures are? Um, what's their procedures for receiving their work assignment charge numbers and description like so they should receive that revenue in the contract? And how often the employee completes their timesheet? It's very important to complete them on a daily basis, um, especially when I can say there are multiple contracts being with them. Um, and whether the employee includes all hours worked. You know, sometimes you may get the timesheet and you know, the past two days only charge six hours instead of the full eight hours, so you know, what was the difference? Why didn't they charge their full hours? And also, what's their approval process when they complete their timesheet? Then they sign off first, and then the supervisor signs off afterwards. You know. And also, if there's any changes 
to the timesheets, how are they making those corrections. And also there's an audit trail available, so any changes that are made to the timesheet, there should be an audit trail in place with the system that allows us to see, yes, these hours were changed on this date and this time. Also, if we select someone and they're not available, um, we're going to perform a follow-up just to visit <coughs> and make sure that employee you know, is actually there and, and we'll ask them the same questions from the prior interviews. Um, we'll also take um, any accusations during you know, of the procedures or the practices that we've started in the floor check. Yeah, so. Also, I said there's also multiple locations. The other may coordinate with the other DCA office to perform evaluations. For example, if you have a location here in Dayton, we also have an office at Atlanta. You know, uh, we will get your employee listing up front, like we asked for, and then we'll contact our Atlanta branch office for DCA and ask them to help us assist in interviewing um, the employees and getting their timesheets for a selected number of the ones that's on the list. So, and also we will take their results we will incorporate into our overall welcome report. Um, also, um, finally, the contractors are able to respond. Once we do complete our evaluations, we will do an exit conference with you. We'll tell you if we have any findings and what they were. If these <coughs> issues were noted, the audit will furnish a draft version of the findings to present it in the business system deficiency report. So you are aware of the issues that we noted um, and what corrective action, action is going to be. And the contract is also given the opportunity to respond to our findings. We can take those oral, or you can do written, you do an official memo or email, what's best for you, but we will take your results, and we will incorporate into the report, so when we do issue our, um, issue our findings, our findings and also your response to um, the issues will be in there. Questions? Okay, so I know you mentioned if a, if a person didn't allocate for their full eight hours. <coughs> what if they um, have reported something over the number of, of numbers that they're supposed to work? Well, how do you handle like that? Like over numbers as in the hours or? Mm -hmm. I mean, like they were supposed to work eight, but they actually work ten, for example. Okay. Well, then there should be. You know, were they charging overtime or was it? No, like it, they just put they worked 10 hours, but it was, uh, they were still compensated for eight. That was just, just uh, yeah, like salary. So, yeah, salary. Yeah. Like yeah. total yeah. time accounting, yeah. however yeah. many hours they worked. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like she was saying, there was uncompensated overtime. Mm -hmm. so they have to report their hours. Mm -hmm. You can't say, I worked 10 hours, I worked five on this contract and five on this. So I'm only going to report four hours for this contract and four on another one. So you have to report the total hours, including the uncompensated overtime. So what I'm asking is how is uncompensated overtime, how is that handled? From the, the, do you know how that's handled from the business side or how it should be handled? Like what should we do if, if that well, happens? At, at the end of the day, it's, it's about the proper distribution of the labor cost mm -hmm. for the pay period that's being reported. Um, so these so, Wednesday, it was a bad, long day. They had Tuesday audited or something. Probably going to call, right? <laughs> okay, so the overhead. You charge that the overhead while you're in the UN. 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 You're in the but the, the bottom line is at the end of the pay period, we're going to have X hours here, we're going to have Y hours here. We want to distribute that payroll dollars 
in relationship to this, to the total. That's the end game. Okay. You, you know, it's not done on a daily basis. It's done on a pay period by pay period basis. Okay. Make sense? So by percentages, is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Prorated. Pro prorated as appropriate. You know, if you have to take, you know, if they work 100 hours and they're getting paid, the assumption is 80 hours, then it's a matter of prorating the actual hours worth so that there's a total distribution of only 80 hours. Gotcha. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you know, I hear you say that if you're using a digital system, it's preferred to have some paper backups. Do you no, like to see those? I just remember back in the old days. <coughs> okay. Sometimes we had to get there. We would run across each desk and just grab the time sheets as we were going for the employees. Mm -hmm. But no, we, we do electronic version. Usually the point contact will have access to everyone's time sheets so they can just you know, click on each employee's name and just print it off. We also like to observe you know their location as well, of them pulling up their timesheet. Doesn't hurt. Good. Okay. So yeah. did you I, remember the old, I just remember the old days. Let's run around just grabbing papers. Okay. Sheets. And then we go back and interview them. The digital system, either system is acceptable. The mm -hmm. important thing is having the appropriate internal controls to ensure that at the end of the day we've gotten valid, reliable, good data. The, the point of having a focal point print off the timesheets is, okay, we've got that element of surprise, we've got them as of the moment we walk in the door. Asking an employee to print off his or her timesheet when we're interviewing them demonstrates and illustrates how well they understand the timekeeping system they're using, what the policies and procedures are. Good, I'll give you an example. We're currently issuing, we just did a floor check, and we interviewed six individuals, and the question is about how does the employee submit his timesheet? We have four different answers from six uh. individuals. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> there needs to be a little training so that we have consistency that if the policy is we do it this way, let's ensure that the audit or the staff is in fact aware of it and then properly submits it. Thank you. So in general, yeah, I know you say uh, submit or uh, put your uh, time entries in on a daily basis. You know, sometimes people work pretty late at night and it says last thing they want to do is their time card. So they hit it in the morning. You're pretty much looking for that one case where there's a whole week there and they haven't entered any of their time in there or, or an extended period of time. Right? It could be a day or two. There's a grace in there. Two weeks. There could be a, I mean, you have that expressed the concerns that they're working on, like, if they're tired, like, I don't have to pull that time sheet out. But then, you know, the longer you wait, it's like, okay, what did I work on that day, you know? Yeah, well, that was my question. There's a little bit of a grace period in there. So you get hard over when you see something I mean, something if it's like the night before, week. they're missing it, you ask, hey, why didn't you fill out your time yeah. sheet the day before? And then there'll be an honor's judgment on how they want to. You know, if they see it from a lot of employees, they may make it a decision at the end of the just one employee that did it, you know, they just let it go. It just depends on the auditor's judgment on that. Okay. A lot of it, too, is about how you as a contractor set up your policies and procedures. If your policy is the timesheets are completed by 10 o'clock the subsequent day, to accommodate that type of scenario, you know, we would plan our audit to come in after 10 o'clock so that we've given you the opportunity to demonstrate compliance with your own policies and procedures. Now, it's as she said, we have one instance, okay, it happens, it's not a big deal. In a recent one that I'm just wrapping up, we have three out of six, where it ranges from one, we did it on Wednesday, so we have one that has one day that's not completed, we have two others that nothing was completed from Monday or Tuesday. Again, it's about bringing that to your, your awareness as a contractor ensure that how can I ensure that I have good data in the system. Also sometimes good some systems allow the person who's in charge of the timekeeping to get a red alert and say, hey this employee does not fill a time sheet out it's mm -hmm. like 1005. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. also good to have those systems in place as well. We've got those systems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say I've seen hundreds of systems where the system automatically generates and sends an email to employees that don't have 
their time sheet completed by 10 o'clock the next day. Mm -hmm. So they get that reminder, and you didn't complete your time sheet yesterday. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Sure. Um, I just want to go to, I'll probably come over there and drive if that's okay. Sure. I was going to show them the website. You see a website? I think the easiest way to do them versus a presentation is to show them the website. We do, in recent years, I would say in the last two years, we've um, put we've put in place a small business focal point that sits um, in uh, DC. Um, but we've also put some resources out there for small business. Prior, you may remember that we had a publication that was information for contractors, which that is out here, but there's also presentations, like the presentations that we gave today. I won't say they'll be exactly the same, but they'll be, you know, the, it'll be the same information, you know, a few words may be different, a few slides may be different, but they're out on our website. So I'm gonna show you guys where that information is at. So. <laughs> I mean, we are currently going through a significant reorganization. Um, so there'll be, you know, probably some information coming out about that. We're um, redefining our regions. We're going from like five regions to three, and we're taking the larger contractors and aligning them, you know, more in, in corporate networks. Um, so our organizational structure is is currently, you know, being revamped. So and that's supposed to take effect like the 1st of October. Um, but this just kind of goes through like the pre-award um, survey, the overview. So kind of, it's going to be what I went through today. Um, labor accounting system, labor keeping system, proposals. So it's kind of a guide. So when you guys are going through this, when you're having the pre-award, when you're doing the proposal, it's a resource for you guys to go and look at to provide you information. So and these are the presentations. So as you can see, this is the presentation that I gave today. So all of that is out there for you guys to download. They are in PDF format, I believe. So they won't be in PowerPoint. <laughs> wow. It doesn't look so <laughs> moved. That looks a little I don't have an audit. No, I was going to say, I yeah. pulled these up. Whoa. That's awesome. Beautiful yeah. stuff. This well, is awesome. I really can't believe it. Uh, <laughs> I pulled this up like multiple times, so it's maybe make a note to check those and because maybe it's a PDF or something. Just, yeah, maybe it's a PDF. You read the yeah. bigger it's yeah. 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 It is edge. That's probably on the website. It's actually it's yeah. the computer and yeah. software. So, and then this is. Um, we Guidance that, you know, requesting an audit, you know, obviously that's out there for the contracting officers, uh, an audit overview pro uh, 
audit process overview information for the contractors. This is the director of all, directory of audit programs. So like if we tell you we're coming out to do a pre-award accounting system, you know, we have our own little indicators, but the program description will give it to you. You can come on here and pull up. Okay, this is the program that we're going to start with. So this is what the agency has set forth at, you know, our, our starting point. Now, we obviously have to modify every audit program because every audit is different, every company is different. So, but this is our starting groundwork and we add and delete steps as we determine necessary. But all, you know, all the types of audits are out there. So you can go and you can pull those audit programs down. Where was the brief on the floor checks? Was that on the first page as well? Yeah. The brief? Yeah. It was. I didn't see the title of the first button or something. Oh, it's called? Labor. Real-time labor. Real-time labor. Real-time labor. Yeah, Real -time labor. Labor. Well, that's checks. our new, <laughs> yeah. that's our new word. Real-time labor evaluations. Right. Don't that's worry, we're all struggling. Trying to find <laughs> from, where's the floor check? Uh, where's the floor check? Thank <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you. But that did, and then also out here is like links to um, CAS, FAR, FAR cost principles, DFARs, Yellow Book, those are the standards by which we operate. So, you know, sometimes that will provide you some insight on why we do things the way we do versus if you have like a price analysis done versus an audit. So, you know, why we have to go to the level of detail, you know, why we review, why we witness you pulling information from your system, document how you generate that information from your system. Those are things that we're required to do that maybe a price analyst isn't required to do. Um, but that would give you some insight. There's some frequently asked questions. Um, also, just there's checklists and tools out there. The pre-award accounting system, so there's your um, SF1408, contract pricing, the proposal checklist, which we'll go over, forward pricing, rate proposal checklist, so if you're, providing, or if you're proposing just rates, um, there's a checklist for that. Incur cost submission and adequacy checklist. Um, that's what we use when you submit your incur cost submission to review it for adequacy, cost of money rates, um, easy quant applications. That's our um, quantitative method software. So, and then just in case you don't know where your local DCA office is, there's a DCA locator. You can put in your city, state, zip code, and it'll tell you, you know, what audit or office is cognizant, you know, for your location. So, and I think, you know, the about us tells about us, our mission, and um, any questions on our are, website, that's Are there of, any big changes coming to you guys from the um, 2016 NDAA or the 2017 NDAA <laughs> you may be seeing coming your way? Well, we currently... You don't change much, I would assume. Well, we currently are getting our reimbursables. Yeah. I, I mean, that is, that's a very good question, because with the passage of the last NDAA, we, a certain percentage of our work is for reimbursable contractors because, as she, she was in a comment about our currency and incurred costs, because of our lack of being current, um, it was written into the law we weren't allowed to do reimbursable work until we reached a backlog of no greater than 18 months. So, <laughs> so hopefully, this new NDAA, you know, we're striving towards the goal of 18 months, but it, you know, we don't know necessarily what's going to be in the NDA, unfortunately, until it is published. But I, I you know, there is something going on with the NDA that there, there is a risk there, but we, we haven't heard anything recently. Mm -hmm. Like, like I said, the the incur costs are really a high focus and high visibility, and they're looking to see. You know how we well, can get I mean, done. two years would be better than the one company I worked for was ten years behind. Mm -hmm. so, so that was pretty, pretty bad. Well, and you but know, I'm just saying and that two eighteen years months is better than eighteen. I mean, that's well, awesome. And that eighteen to, months is an average. Yeah, so, you and know, that's. I mean, well, that's fine. As and long as you guys are striving in that way, that's great. And it's from the date of receipt of the proposal. Receipt of an adequate, adequate submission. submission. Yeah. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So eighteen. Yeah. months from that date is so is what we're striving for so and you know 
there are shifting of resources to help the agency accomplish that. You know, well, and I we're not the Dayton the branch, we're not the Eastern Region, we are right. DCAA. So I just don't think you have the bandwidth to, to take care of it. That was part of the problem. And you guys had so many other things. Yeah, you I doubt that. <laughs> 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 well, that yeah. we're, I think we're lucky these days to keep up with attrition usually. So yeah. And I think currently aging wise we're hiring two hundred yeah. new honors currently possible. So you are getting young people in there wanting to do this stuff. Yeah. That's great. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I loved guys. it. I love being an auditor. It was, it was such a learning experience. On every mobile auditor that I worked at, their system was different. And you learned different from them. It was never, it was never boring. So yeah. you know, what you audit, yeah. you're learning something new. So we could be here for 20 years and we still learn something new. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a job. It's a very, I love it. Martin and I are neighbors, and we, we yeah. always get frustrated when we learn something new. Both of us do. But you know, and the, it, the thing is, DC offered so many. I think opportunities like myself like the advantage of you know living around the world. So I saw a lot of different things, had a lot of different challenges. You don't talk about this stuff after work, do you? Now does my hour drive home? Does that count work time when I call uh, no, my colleague? <laughs> Now that I have a son, no, not really. But before that, <laughs> I usually didn't leave till seven or so. So, but. all right. That was very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.